Hello, and well, let's see what this is going to be like. Today, I'm going to be answering the questions about the uh, from the first of the Equitable Treaty series. This is, of course, an Equitable Washington Treaty. Well, how do I put it slightly? Capital ships. It had its own UAD feature in it in the past, so I thought I would do some more UAD while discussing the questions and going through them. There are quite a few questions. Some of them I have already responded to in the, in the questions and comments below, but I thought you might enjoy another one and might enjoy me going through some of my answers. So, this is what I'm doing today, and yes, I am recording this on Friday the 29th of April, mainly because the recording I did earlier was a bit naff, in that it was very, very juddery. And I found out the reason it was juddery was because, honestly, I hadn't put it up to 60 frames per second. I tried it on 30, because that's what I record pretty much everything else. But it didn't like it. So, I am today be doing it on 60 frames per second and hopefully he's going to be happy and all will be well in the world but we will see we'll see i'm also going to do something which i haven't done before i'm going to produce a battleship and i'm going to produce, uh, set it up as a couple of them. but i'm going to pick as an opponent pretty much by random so we're going to see what uad sets me up with Instead of me doing my normal of going through and carefully selecting it, I just want to see what they come with, and then I'm going to experiment and build that. So we'll see what happens. So, hopefully, this should be fun. The game for the UAD part should start in... One, two, three. So, this is what UAD has set me up with. The British versus the Spanish. Or rather, I chose the British, but... It's a Spanish and it's 1926, so let's see what the design ship options come up with. I should have a design loaded into 1926. He says he should. But I don't, apparently, at the moment. Ooh, well, I can play around with this. Vengeance. Vengeance will be mine. I want at least 28 knots. I'm sorry, I am not interested in a battleship which does less than 28 knots. And 50,000 tons fully loaded is about fine. Oh, range, uh, yeah, oh, probably about that. Bulkheads, many, but not maximum. Draft, beam, ooh. All these are things I'm going to work with. But let's see what I do with the beam. Um, I want it slightly better, uh, slightly bigger. I want that about 2.4%. Yeah, Oh, make it free. And draft a little bit. Give me a slightly more stable platform. Pitch roll, roll 2.1%, engine efficiency 0% at the moment. Well, let's see. Balanced turbine engines. Oh, we want geared turbines, definitely. I'm going to go for the traditional British, which was the auxiliary diesel. Shaft. And because I'm not stupid and I want to actually survive a fight, I'm going to go for the highest uh, ratio of actual control. Ooh. Peter Protection 4. Double hull. Standard bulkheads. Reinforced bulkheads. They're prettier. Reinforced bulkheads really are prettier. And because I'm British, turtle black armor scheme. Because, frankly, why not? 13 inch belt. Oof. I'll make you 14. That'll make you happy, won't it? 14. So let's see. What options do I have tower wise? Ooh. Secondary tower. Can I fit anything on behind this? That's too big. That's too big. I could go down to a compact secondary tab, but honestly, I want something proper behind it. Ooh. <laughs> no, I'm not doing that. Let's see, aiming speed. You see, the trouble is, that's 23.5 aiming speed. 
advantage. So you can't go down that low. 17.5. 17 17.5 17 and 17.5. Let's see. It won't fit on the back. That's 17.5. That will fit on the back. Going to look a little weird, but that'll do me. Right-hand funnels. Engine efficiency 100% with one funnel. Okay. That is fine. Now. Well, that's... Mm, da -da 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 -da. Standard superimposed barbet. See if that works. Because what do I want? Well, we all know what I. Oh, good lord, I could get a quadruple. Do I? Hello, have you met our Lord and Saviour Armageddon of the 12 16 inch guns? I need to fix that. that. That that looks frankly humorous. Okay, I do need to fix that. I will get a better barbette for that one. And the 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 big superimposed barbette. Yeah, that's probably about right. So this is definitely not one of the ones I designed to be uh, um, truthful, but um, to history, but uh, yeah. Um, anyone want to deal with 12 16 inch guns all forward firing coming at you? We'll see what the enemy will make of them in a second. Range. We're going to go coincidence because that's the British standard. Sonar. Radio. I'm going to need to do some effect on your know, operations in a second, aren't I, to get things to work. Hydraulic turrets. I'm going to go for that. As this is now my own fun, this is basically because I've gone for the quadruple guns, which I really shouldn't have. I am basically just ignoring reality now. I am just having fun, just seeing what I could have possibly built. And standard quarters. And lots of betterments. And we'll see what this looks like once I do this. Ooh. Well, for Zardas, I can get rid of that. Oh. Secondary tower can go up to something like this. Oh, that's going to be fun. Ship is overweight. Full weight offset. Full weight offset now 5.2%. Bam, bam, bam. I wonder if I could go for even more. Let's see. Bam, bam, bam. Can I fit another quadruple in there? Can I make this into... Oh, Lord, he didn't. He really didn't, did he? Mm, not quite enough space. Dang it. Mm. Da, 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 da. And move that back. There. Move that back. There. And oh wait, I'll set two percent. Now I need to work on the speed. Take the range down. Ooh, what else are we going to do to get the weight down? We are 6,000 tons overweight. Hmm. Hmm. What are we going to do to get the weight down? 
got to be an option I can think of. There has got to be an option I can think of. There has got to be an option I can think of. To lose 6,000 tons, though, is quite a lot. What's the difference between that and that is between a quadruple turret and a triple turret is 700 tons. So that would not, that would help, but it wouldn't get me everywhere I needed to go. Hmm. What can we do? How can we do this? This is a very powerful and very beautiful looking ship. It's almost looking G3-ish but with a more sensible gun arrangement. Hello, my beauties. I, do, I don't want to lose you. Now I've got you, I do not want to lose you. I don't want to lose you. How am I going to get this to work? Balanced barbettes. Put them down to three. That's 2,000 tons. Uh, that's uh, down to now 5,000 tons over. That's 1,000 tons gone. Mm -hmm. Take this down to 12, because... I can. That really doesn't help me that much, so there's not much point bothering with that one. Aft belts. Slightly heavier already. Um, fore deck. Aft deck is slightly thicker. All these are slightly thicker already. That's always good. Let's go for... Let's see the armor scheme. Can I... Mm-hmm. All or nothing gives me an extra what? Yeah, it helps. It helps. It gives me. It takes me down to uh, for, within three thousand two hundred of the lim of what I need to get to. What else can I do to drop the weight? What else can I do to drop the weight? Oh, you're going down. So now I'm down to ah, 2,200 tons overweight. What is the, causing me to have this heavy weight? Standard. 300 tons overweight. Reinforced bulkheads. Hmm. I now have, theoretically, an extra 600 tons to spread around. Ooh, what can I use 600 tons for? I think what we need is some more secondary guns. Mm-hmm. Okay, yes. I, 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 this is basically my ode to I want a triple turret. But if I'm being honest, and the time period, I should be going for this. Well, you know, I could argue about that, but I'm not going to. I'm going to go nicely with my triple of four inch guns. Aft weight offset 6.4%, and it's slightly over. Let's see, what can we do? <laughs> I'll see, I might get rid of that. Because if I go for this one, that gives me a whole few hundred more tons to play with. And it's not much of a drop in capabilities. And, to be honest, that'll do. And I've got 700 tons more to play with, so where should I play with them? Half deck a bit. Half belt a bit. Half deck a bit. No, hang on, no, four belt a bit. Just a little bit. Uh, 
and four deck. Just a tad. Just a tad. Just a tad. Just a tad. Sorry, main deck. Can't do anything more to you. But you're looking good. You're looking pretty. And you have got 12 16 inch guns <laughs> in an all forward arrangement. <laughs> oh, let's go see what we can build for our opponent. Let's be nice. Okay. They are lovely people, the Spanish. I should be kind to them. Let's see what I can give them in terms of a main tower. That looks kind of appropriate to what I just built. Secondary tower. I'm looking for something with equal, equivalent base aiming speed. Well, as much as good as I can give them. This is probably going to have to go. Let's be this. Let's be fair about this weight. Let's put this up to sixty-four thousand or sixty thousand tons. And let's be nice to them and give them 25 knots, because that's more than their ships ever actually really had. Um, beam, I, I, I can't be as generous beam and draft-wise, but I can be somewhat generous. Yeah, this is the best I can give you. Secondary funnels. Engine efficiency 100%. That's always good. I will give them standard, and I will be generous again, and I will give them seasoned. Seasoned. And I'll give them all the oil fire. That'd be nice. Come on, I can be nice. It's been known for me to be nice at least once in a blue moon. I'll be very generous. I'll give them, make sure they have crap for them. Basically, this is a ship which never existed, let's be honest. I'm not sure why I'm giving both sides triple, uh, triple uh, anti-torpedo defenses when I've not given fitting torpedoes to anything so far. And you can have all or nothing to... Right then. Barbets. Let's give you a big superimposed barbette, and let's see what can I fit on you. What are the main gun options and line guns? Oh, we can be fair. We can be, broadly speaking, fair. Within the confines of the ship, we can be, broadly speaking, fair. Okay, uh, I need to find a way to fit that on that ship. Back here. Um, da -da 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 -da. There we go. This is a Spanish Iowa. <laughs> Not really. Iowa would have liked this many. Actually, yeah. It would be cool. Seriously. I had designed two really very cool ships. Barbettes. Right. And that. And let's go to this and be nice. And lecture hydraulic. And... Oh, we're already overweight. Okay, we're going to give you decent sonar. We're going to give you decent RBF. And we're now going to try and work out how to get you down from the weight as well. Uh, take you down to 12. There. 12 there. 6. 6. 6. Three point six. Twelve. Okay. All right then. We are now three thousand tons overweight. So, what should we do? What should we do for you? You also go down to those, and you also go down to many. 
And now I have a little bit more weight to give you, so I can do something nice and give you a present. What shall a present shall I give you? Five inch guns, I think. I shall give you five inch guns, because that is me being kind and good and a nice soul. Everyone noticing that? Five inch guns. Yeah. Okay. I do need to do something about the full weight offset on this ship. I am not sure how we're going to tackle that one. The only thing I could do is move the funnel back, but I can't really move the funnel back in the design spacing. Rearrange all the armor? Masses of work? We'll see. We'll see what happens. Let's launch into the battle and let me launch into the questions. So I'm going to, of course, be fair, and I'm going to hand over control of my beautiful ships, my glorious super ships, which... If I could send the design back in time to, I don't know, Admiral Fisher in 1905, he would probably have built. Because let's be honest, if I told Admiral Fisher, you can have something with 12 16-inch guns that looks like this, he'd have gone, I love you, whoever you are, strange demon through coming through history to me. AI is on, and we are pl uh, they are playing. We have Superb, we have Vengeance, we have Neptune, and we have Warspite! We have a Warspite! Warspite alert! There is a Warspite, and oh my goodness me, does she look beautiful. Slightly G3-esque uh, sort of design, but still pretty beautiful. As you can see, many, many 4-inch guns over the rear. And even a couple forward. So yes. Although, I think if memory correctly, those ones are the 6-inch guns. And then it's the 4-inch guns aft. So, yes. We have some 6-inch guns. We have many 4-inch guns. This is going to be a battle. It's going to be a joyous battle. 4-inch guns covering the rear, so no torpedo attacks from here, please. 6-inch guns covering the forwards and... The flat sides, and of course, <laughs> 12 16 inch guns just to make the point if ever you need to. Fun times, right? Then, so let's do that. And I'm gonna stay focused on webs of war spite at the back of the group. And I'm gonna pull up the questions now. And it's always fun when I do pull up the questions because, well, this is usually the point at which it causes everything to die on me. So I am doing what I did last time, which is I'm reading the questions off my phone. I do have them on the big screen next to me in case I need to clarify, but I'm reading them off my phone because if I try and read them off the computer, it decides to get a panic attack. And it stops looking at my pic uh, my pretty ships as they fight for their glory against, well, I would love to say against an equivalent enemy, but let's be honest, this is the Spanish. And the Spanish in the 1920s and 1930s, you've got to love them because that's the only option you have for them, really. So, starting off with Knight 6831. <laughs> Hello, Knight. One of the things I always know is I always know I get a lot of uh, uh, some questions from you on these videos, and it's always nice to get them. Yeah, exactly how can you expect the treaty to work if they are creative accounting, as you said, in the yesterday's brew ships? Then, yeah, it's already failed. Pretty much, you are going to get creative accounting whatever happens. We notice design into the treaty as a basis that there's going to be creative accounting. You have a choice. You can either try and make things incredibly specific, which actually tends to allow for more opportunities for creative accounting, or you can make it very broad, which makes it more difficult for people to do creative accounting. And that's basically the option I've gone with. The London treaties, as we'll get into, try to go the specific route of to avoid a creative accounting, and this creates a very different scenario. As we can see here, the Spanish, in an unusual scenario, A, have four battleships, when they usually actually only had two. B, they have 16-inch guns and actually look like proper battleships. And C, have equivalent numbers to the Royal Navy. And as we know, in any reality, 
of the 1920s and 30s, this would not have happened, least of all in 1926. But, boy gum, this is going to be fun. Uh, right. More questions from 96831. Uh, this was taken at 7072. This is that you timestamp your questions. Let's see. 1,415 from Edris Hood, 14 from Edris Prince of Wales at Denmark Strait and Malaya, and at Malaya, we have 327 from Edris Prince of Wales and 508 from Prince of Wales. That's 2,264 men dead, including two high-ranking animals and two highly experienced captains. Yes, when you lose a capital ship, it is quite expensive. Mostly in personnel than anything else, because a ship is easier to recreate than the personnel, especially the 40 years of experience. 1728. Yeah, if Hood and Repulse were able to get the upgrades and Wales was built to, uh, to, to a design that makes her the best she could have been, well, yeah. Under your treaty, how did the British make Wales the best she can be? How do they upgrade Hood and Repulse to make them better, given in the, in the case of Hood, you'd be, you're dealing with a ship that frankly cannot fully be sorted out due to limitations of a flawed design? Was that frigating worth it? Honestly, it frigating isn't. The frigating politicians who wrote this frigating treaty were living in delusional fantasy land. War is difficult to prevent. War is very difficult to present, prevent, but And I say this with love in my heart for the political systems that were involved. The trouble for most of the politicians and the Navy at this point is that if you look at the system I'm, devise, I'm putting forward, these ships can be replaced. What, Hood would probably be one of the last, if not the last, of the pre-treaty ships to be replaced. Being as close as she is to the limits. But they could be replaced. And that's the thing. Prince of Wales wouldn't exist because in the nicest way, Prince of Wales, if she did exist, would be based off a design as built in the in the sort of the iterations of treaty designed ships. Instead of there being one generation of treaty battleships and then the rest of the battleships all built are coming in at the end of the treaty battleship era, there'd be lots of treaty ships built. And so you'd have an iterative design process going on. Mm -hmm. Ooh, Numancia, you've had damage. Oof, that's not nice. Stop being cruel to Numancia, she's quite cute. I do feel sorry for these ships. And that, uh, it's again, it's the whole thing, it's the what's the most efficient design you can build on a fixed tonnage and a fixed size. Well, the most efficient design you can build on a fixed tonnage and a fixed size is probably this. But there again, Superb's getting pretty, pretty damaged. Admittedly, that's probably my own choices, especially in terms of the um, <clears throat> using certain things. Oh, that's on me. I still like these ships. I don't know what's going to happen. Anyway. The point is, you would have replaced Hood. That is the point. And it's kind of like I'd like to replace the AI, which never seems to know how to deal with an all forward gun ship. But we'll leave that to one side. Right. Now. Nice agreement. Hmm. Giving the USA to four Colorados, two Tennessees, two New three New Mexicos, two Pennsylvanias, two Nevadas, two New York, and two Wyoming, and two Floridas, doesn't solve the problem of being the them being of being them rendered obsolete by Hood, in fact. Didn't Hood render Queen Elizabeth and revenge is obsolete? No. Because it was only one ship, and also, in the nicest way, it couldn't actually beat them in a fight. It could choose not to fight them. Plus, watch the whole video. You see USA gets a build ship too. Hmm. And also, in the nicest way, Hood doesn't make the Queen Elizabeth and the Revengers obsolete, because the Queen Elizabeth and the Revengers are battleships. And as I said before, a battle cruiser, if it chooses to fight a battleship, is going to be in trouble because it hasn't got the armor to stick the fight. Its only choice in a fight with a battleship is one of maneuver and to keep keep outmaneuvering the enemy battleship. If it manages to do that, it can win. It, but it, it has to be lucky every single time because every hit it receives is going to do far more damage because of where it's built 
than ever uh, than likelihood of every hit the battleship receives. So a battle cruiser never renders a battleship obsolete. Strider, I honestly don't think this treaty would have ever brought peace of any kind whatsoever. The way the world was and the mindset of the peoples around the world, all the angst and our hostility, no treaty was ever going to solve. Shit. Let's say they made it all even. I feel there are more variables than that to go in peace than this treaty. Basically, the Washington Treaty is trying to make peace by force peace by stopping everyone building warships and making everyone equally weak. And as I've pointed out, the only way you can really guarantee peace is if you can make everyone equally strong or everyone completely disarmed. And if you can't guarantee everyone is completely disarmed, it's everyone's got to be strong and feel strong enough to defend themselves. And they can't be equally strong because... America isn't always going to have a larger force, in the, especially these days, than the UK is. So what you need to do is right then go ask people, what is the level of strength you feel you are secure at? That will be proportional as a rule. Gordon Smith, when I was a child, my grandfather told me never give an order that will not be obeyed. A wise man, yes. And it's even wiser when writing a treaty. Do not write a treaty that is going to automatically force people to lie to you. Nine six eight three one again. Uh, yeah, six to eight dreadnought battleships a year made sense in the pre World One year uh, years. But considering how expensive the Hood was, yeah, the next generation are going to cost more than the Hood. And are considering the Wall Street crash in nineteen twenty nine, super duper nail rods. Yeah, mega nail rods might have been better. I like super duper nail rods. I think it's a cool, uh, uh, cool thing. And as I said. Mega, uh, Mega sounds very power rangery, and that to me is just not proper for a, a warship. Martin Peacock. Hello, Martin. I always look forward to your uh, your comments as well. I think the RM would go for a free free two battleship program with the ability to lay down an extra ship when they need to. This not only lets them build a solid base of fast battleships early, but also respond to the threats by laying down a ship. That threat could be either a belligerent foreign power or a battle cruiser being laid down by another power. With Hood and Renown not being scrapped until 1938, there is possibility of reconstructing the 15 inch gun battlecruisers for more speed. That allows the RN to hedge their bets until they see what everyone else is doing. The RN has the most powerful battlecruiser force, after all. I also think that this would be quite, have been quite an attractive option as a response to the Great Depression. Build an extra battleship that year for more jobs and be bringing the battle in the battlecruiser to be upgraded to keep those jobs going. It was Hood, Renown, and Repulse. At 34 plus knots is a fun thought. My response was, I thought you would enjoy this, uh, this one. Oh, uh, uh, you're not done. And he wasn't done yet. John Evans. I often thought if Britain would have been better off retaining Lion, Princess Royal, and converting them and Tiger to oil, rather than two of the Iron Dukes. Possibly arguing for them to have the same rearmament arrangement as uh, Renown. It would have been interesting, certainly. But... I think myself that... The problem is kind of like what we're seeing in this fight here. If you retain older ships, and these ships are all equal in age, so equally built, etc., equally, they're fighting, and it's a, very, a fairly even match. Even though I would argue that the all the forward armor is more efficient, and some of these ships are yet to be really damaged, they are still putting up a very decent fight, and a very capable fight, and again, some of the Spanish ships are yet to be damaged. The San Miguel here. You can't keep bringing in new old ships and repairing them and hoping they're going to match in against equivalent ships, because often the way you will build the actual internal design of a ship will change as time goes on to match the new technology. You can only adapt that internal design so much to keep it pace with new in pace with new technology. And that's a limitation you have to think about. Uh, 
Alright then. And by World War Night 6831, and by World War II, Britain's luck finally ran out. I guess Hood's deterrent presence did what it was supposed to, but once the fast battleships start appearing, it's fatally undermined. Yeah, because basically whilst it can go fast enough to keep away from regular battleships, one bit of damage and it's not gonna be it's not gonna be able to outrun by enough speed the fast battleships. And the fast battleships, as I've said before, have the armor to stay in the fight. Nice How does this change the uh, change prevent the treaty system from the, uh, from imploding in the 1930s? Because, and this was my response, because you don't leave a treaty which is working for you, or at least which you feel helps secure position. A 10-7 ratio means the Japanese feel secure, and the treaty binds the US as much as it does them. In fact, it binds the, treaty, the US and the UK more than it does Japan. Because Japan, it's lot of those nations can outbuild Japan very easily once they're free of the treaty. And Japan does understand this. So if you've bound them into a 7-10 ratio, you have that strength. The trouble is, once you're bound into a 5-3 ratio where you feel weak and you can't, you don't feel you can actually defend yourself, Mason, then that does the reverse. That makes you feel permanently weak. Whereas a 10-7 ratio would have made Japan feel strong. They'd have still known they couldn't have won a war, so they'd have had to think about and things and listen, but they wouldn't have felt they were constantly having to do stuff to prove how strong they were. Uh, Andrew Reynolds, I suppose there's always scope for extension. I'm guessing a lot of limits won't change, it wouldn't change much, and a lot of treaty would deal with refits and equivalent replacement. There might be more definition on small, for smaller ships uh, too, though. Well, this is the thing. When I'm getting into the London treaties, this is going to be my question. Do I start off with the Washington Treaty as it was happening, or do I start off with the Washington Treaty as it was if it had been under the equitable scenario I've put forward? And... That's going to be something I'm going to answer when I get into the actual London treaties. Martin Peacock, told you I wasn't done. So on the sh uh, ships the nations build, I actually think the Americans and Japanese delay start constructing of new battleships. More on them in a bit, though. I agree the British go for 40k, a thousand ton ships, and build up to 21 ships. The British have nothing to gain by waiting and getting the ball rolling and announcing that they are building these ships well inside the treaty limits lets the world know this is for real. Plus it keeps the yards working, which is good. As for the ship itself, I agree I think a 28 to 30 knot fast battleship is the way Britain goes. I actually think 30 knots is where Britain will settle. I already spoke about battlecruisers a bit, but if Britain is not sure if they are going to be building battlecruisers, they could well decide to go a bit faster and get a more multi-purpose ship. The Americans have Congress to deal with, so that could be some wrangling with their delays. Ooh, hang on. I think the Spanish have lost something. Either they have lost... Uh, I think they have. I think I missed it, but I think they've lost something. Hello, there's San Paolo. And some, uh, no, uh, there's Edo. But the Spanish have lost something. Ooh, I think they have. They're down to three. I missed it. I do apologize. I was so wrapped up in Martin's questions. But, yeah. Oh, they're down to 200, mm, roughly 500 rounds. Roughly 900 rounds in Vengeance. I think Superb is, uh, if I was Superb, I'd be going my own way quickly. Because I'm fairly certain Superb is not going to be around for long if she keeps fighting. She got, it, look, it looks like they sunk a Spanish ship just before... They got superb. Uh, although superb does appear to be completely floating, but she's only twenty two percent structurally there. So yeah, no tor this is what happens when you have no torpedoes on a fight. Oh, 
Oh. Samuel Gale seems to be though making straight for Suburb. Which is possibly not the best idea because I have a feeling the rest of the squadron will come back to her. And yeah, they're already turning. So basically, you go and attack Superb, you're probably going to be running into the guns of Neptune, Vengeance, and Warspite. Warspite has managed to get a bit of damage, somehow. Hmm. And to watch these, we will. So, the Americans have Congress to deal with, so there could be some wrangling there that delays things. As soon as Britain says they're going for 40,000 ton ships, that is a jail car, though. Congress can fund smaller and cheaper ships, and the USN can actually build something. I think they stick to a slow South Dakota-type design, as the Americans do have that interesting relationship with speed in this time period, as you mentioned. I also just think that of guns, armor, speed triangle, that speed is the most easy sacrifice for what the Americans want, want its fleet to be. Japan is the interesting one. I think they wait the longest, as they will want to see what Britain and America will do. That way they can tailor their ships to meet the threats they might face. That is why I think they probably end up the clean sheet design that is the full 42,000 tons you suggested. My suggestion is they go for 12 16-inch guns and 26 28 knots to match the Americans in firepower whilst accepting a bit less speed than the British ships. That along with the 2,000 extra tons to build which should allow a fairly balanced ship that can match up well to either the threats. Yes, the British uh, the ships can't slug it out, as well as the Americans with the less armour, uh, but the higher speed allows them to dictate the, the engagement more to their advantage, and even the odds. Against the British, they will have a disadvantage of speed, but the extra guns on the ships will negate that to some degree. Your thoughts? My thoughts were, well, that the logic flowed. Not quite the same stream mine followed, but um, not that similar in result. I agree the faster battleship design the iron choose, the less likely battlecruisers get built, especially as carriers mature. Martin Peacock again. Doctor, the more I um, think on it, the more I think Britain tries to figure out the battlecruiser question by rebuilding the existing ships to see what they gain. Probably starting with Tiger. With Tiger, they can probably get quite a turn of speed, swapping early 1910s coal and oil mix, large tube boilers, some mid to late 1920s small tube oil boilers. This probably also represents a better allocation of resources than work on any battleship built pre treaty, as you aren't getting them to the capability needed to stand in line with the treaty ships. Turning Tiger into a supercruiser of sorts, a trial 35 knot battlecruiser if they get her that fast, could be quite valuable whilst not taking a ship out of service for a while that is more useful. Um, while I have saying st uh, Tiger staying in service till 1932, which would allow plenty of time for that sort of thing, and with new battleships being built, any reconstruction of battlecruisers will be A, cheaper, as they represent work in addition to a steady base volume of work, and B, would be the focus as why spending... Why spend money on ships you're going to be replacing soon anyway? Under my timeline, the Queen Elizabeths are even out of service by 1938, and even before that would be uh, would uh, would five or twenty five uh, be five or twenty five or twenty battleships by 1936. By 1942, not even the first generation of treaty builds would still be in service, unless war looked likely. And then I wouldn't be surprised if they survive somehow. Commander Peacock, my thinking is the QEs might actually go before Tiger if she's extended and modernised. A modernized Tiger is far more useful than a QE, as she represents something different and is useful experiments at least, and a nice deterrent at worst. The problem for Britain is that outside of maybe the Atlantic, any capital ships they have that aren't treaty ships will be completely outclassed. Keeping Q Queen Elizabeth around to form a part of a battle line is asking for trouble. A battle cruiser, however, particularly a very fast one, is both useful ship to protect against cruisers and also to keep potential opponents on their toes. True. Andrew Reynolds, if they take the battleship limit down from the good to, uh, from good to a nice round 40,000 tons, then 15 to 18,000 tons on the heavy cruisers, I think that might be enough to satisfy the peace factions. It takes the rest of the time and upcoming designs and draws it back a little, so there'll be still be some design compromise, but on a reasonable level. On a counterpoint, if the Americans go for some 42,000 ton ships, they could probably get away with completing the South Dakotas that are already building, liking it a bit. I suspect Congress would be happier with the cost saved from that rather than scrapping a project starting fresh. This does depend on a, a, on an allowed construction schedule, so maybe some of the ships are still scrapped. scrapped. Hmm. John South. They may have had good intentions, but as far back as Chaucer, we know the road to hell is paved with good intentions. True? Glenn McGovery, new hypothesis. Let's say we build a scaling Washington Naval Treaty, starting at 30,000 tons and increasing each year by 1,000 tons, 
permitting a quarter inch of increasing maximum gun size. The idea being that there is no unpredictable scaling effects, but everyone can also plan and organize to build a big new ship in a few years' time. And so can everyone else who can plan and design to build similar ships to replace their old designs. It would also be more realistic than the Senate deciding all future ships must be smaller than current ships on order and that no one will want any progress. While at the same time, every naval power wants to delay their spent naval spending to build ships to match a superior qualification in the future. There are small ships allowed today. It's interesting idea, but the trouble is there's a, a limit to where you get to. In that, in practical, if you're increasing quarter inch every year and you're starting off with 16 inch, then it's going to be about eight years and you're going to get 18 inch. At which point, that's the point where most people are going in. And you're getting 38, probably if you're starting off with 30,000 tons, you're starting off probably with 38,000, at that point, 38,000 tons. And this is the trouble. Most people, most nations will realize this is the point it's going to be. So once you get to 18 inch guns, not many people are going to go and want to go bigger than that because that's the practical gun limit. Mick Brown, on this proposed treaty, how would you see aircraft carry limits being uh, assigned? Can their size add around the largest aircraft, uh, cap their size around the largest aircraft carrier size? I would be wrong, but I think it was a generally understood that effective carriers needed to be larger. That'll be part two of the series, and it was answered in part two, and I hope you enjoyed it, Mick Brown. Um, Knight 6031, let's be honest, no one, other, uh, no one could have somehow other than Admiral Fisher sit for seeing that the aircraft carrier would take off as it did. Fairly sure Henderson did, considering his career path after that, but leave that to one side. Um, so building a battle cruiser for trade protection interdiction, cruiser killing, made sense, especially in a trade-dependent country like the UK and Japan. As it might not be too unreasonable that the USA could build a large fleet of armed commerce raiders, even if the odds are Congress wouldn't go for such a thing or pay for it. True. Jones, like I said previously, I think the biggest issue with this plan is that the French and Italians retain pre-dreads while Britain is scrapping super dreadnoughts. The retained combat power is hugely overshadowed by the new constructions in this situation. Even Queen Elizabeth is not a favourable match against a balanced 42,000 tonne ship. World War II would be very different because no battleship that was in real life service, in real life in service at its start, would still exist except possibly Hood. I can't see any modernizations being worth on this scenario. Um, my thoughts. Another commentator, Martin Peacock, has been talking about this, and honestly, I reckon it's only the battle cruisers that are modernized, mainly to see if it's worth starting and uh, it's worth it starting with Tiger, and only done from the perspective of keeping their speed up relative to the emerging battle line speed. John Evans, I've often wondered how much the cutting of things like the naval budget actually impacted the flow of cash in these economies. People think government and household finance is equivalent, and both should only spend what they have. But actually, a government with a surplus is destroying money in the economy, which might be valid to combat inflation, but in general is limiting growth and therefore tax returns, which can then lead to further spending cuts and down your spiral. A major impact for Britain is the export market post-World War for warships is pretty dead. Not sure if this is a cause or effect, but I wonder if more capital ship construction might see overseas orders return. Battle cruisers might have a place as long as the battle line speed is sub-27-28 knots. Burning up battleships would leave them with of marginal usefulness, I feel. Jonas, this is the conversation going on, because if you put up their speed of 35 knots, plus they have a roll, but it depends on how fast that battle line is. Conserved is 28 knots, aggressive is 30 knots. Honestly, the first batch are probably 28 to 29 knot vessels. The latter batches, though, as a design from the goes, those could be faster. A knot is eked out of it, as a knot are eked out of it. John Evans' response? Well, with the armament point of your Holy Trinity stuck at number 16 inch, I think you're looking at a de facto stand of 9 in, uh, nine in triples, with option to trade speed or protection to get 12 of those guns, possibly in quads, to go uh, go towards Rickaloo style, a ship with a bit more speed or, and all production with savings of the compact citadel. Um, tough ask to get a, all, and this is again from John Evans, tough ask to get an already built ship up to 35 knots. Fixed water wall line length is a limiting factor, and even with hood, I would think you need uh, you need speed around 230,000 sharp horsepower to reach 35 knots with a fairly generous propulsion efficiency, and assuming no cavitation issues. It's a tough ask, but it might be doable. It might be doable. And and that's the last of the questions. So let's see how are they doing? How are things going? for my battleships. Well, it appears they are out of range. But Superb looks like she's about to get sunk. Um, what are the rest of you three doing exactly over there? 
Because you're allowing poor Superb to be stuck out on her own. And, well, yeah, she's out on her own, but actually she might not get sunk because she manages to wear out one of them of ammunition. Oh, and that was, I'm not sure what I was aimed at, but that just hit Edo. Okay. And she's still firing. Rest of you, please. Um, okay. We are going to, I'm, I'm going to have to do some work on you guys, aren't I, at some point? Oh, I don't know. This has definitely been a fight for the ages. Spanish appear to be out of ammunition and down to three ships. Damage. Well, Edo's okay. Ilo's fine and San Miguel's fine. Um... They're all doing, yeah. Hmm. Put that into division two, division three. Go protect division one. <laughs> um, the fact that you're still afloat is beautiful to me, and the fact that you've been doing what you've been doing with now just eight guns remaining of your main battery firing is just cool. I don't think you've actually got in the six inch gun range at all once. Vengeance, what happened to you? How did you get so bashed up? Uh, I think it was that uh, hit. Ah, I needed to upgrade the barbettes. It's putting the barbettes down to three, which has been a big, a big thing. If I'd left the barbettes at four, I'd be fine. Hmm, good ship. Neptune just sailing and going, have I been in a battle? I don't think so. I am completely and utterly untouched, and I still have plenty of ammunition left. Show me to the enemy! I am Neptune! I am Lord of the Sea! Where art thou? Come here! Come here! I'm coming for you! Yep. I'm not... I, Neptune is... Yes, Neptune is, has taken over as the flagship. Oof. And she's doing quite well. But let's see. We have, I think it's basically, uh, I'm almost tempted to go Vengeance into Division 2 with them. So we have War Spite and Neptune as one, and Vengeance and the other. And I'm fairly sure at, certain, at some point... Oh. No, you, you, you found the wounded enemy, haven't you? You're not going to save your friend. You're going to kill... You are such raw Navy battleships, you really are. Seriously, you are supposed to be electrons. You are not supposed to actually act like Royal Navy battleships. I, You're not going to save your friend who's damaged. You are going to kill the nearest wounded enemy you can find. Rumba. Numancia and Guadeloupe. And superb, you are supposed to be damaged. We've been over this. You're still fighting though. You're basically you are the living incarnation of the song, I'm still fighting. I'm still fighting. <laughs> oh. This is the point at which you start to sink. You're too... You, you've got nothing left.
It's just... This is not going to be... There is actually... Pardon me, thinks that actually Superb might get a kill before New Media does. Oi. Although, partial penetration, Superb should be gone. She should be dead. And Guadalupe is now getting bashed up as well. Um, Guadalupe, you don't appear to be capable of firing pretty much anything at the moment. Um, that I'm not quite sure how the ship is actually in any one piece. I'm definitely not sure how Superb is in any one piece. Oh, <sighs> well. That has been practically an hour, and as we can see, the results so far are one Spanish vessel sunk, two Spanish vessels uh, damaged to the point at which they should be, and one British vessel which should be sunk. Finally. I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave it there on poor Superb sinking, but I would like to point out that this ship has pretty much taken everything with it. And that vengeance is coming. Or in the case of Neptune, God of the Sea. And Warspite! And actually, appropriate enough, HMS Vengeance. Which was supposed to be in the same group with Superb. But had left her alone. But still has two working guns, so that's eight 16-inch guns coming, her, uh, coming the way of the um, Spanish. <sighs> Fun times. So, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you enjoyed the questions as much as I do. I always enjoy questions and I always enjoy answering them. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for the support you will give me. And, well, I hope you had a good Friday. I hope you enjoyed this UAD and Views discussion. And I hope you enjoyed the Equitable Treaty series. As I said, there are two more for Washington coming out, and then there's a whole series coming out for London, where I'm combining the treaties, because, frankly, there's no point in treating them separately. It really isn't. They basically fail at the same time, and they are... Well, the second one is a last gasp attempt to try and make it stay relevant and stay supported. And, frankly, they do the exact opposite things of what they need to do to actually make it survive. And I said, when I start those treaties, I'm going to decide whether I'm going to be continuing from the Equitable Treaty, or whether I'm going to be... starting from the Washington's happened, we're now trying to correct this in London. We're trying to make it sensible. Both are attractive to me. So, actually, what I want you to do is, uh, I'm, what I'm thinking about is I want you to comment below on whether you would like me to start from the equitable treaty I've already outlined from Washington, or start as if the Washington Treaty has happened as if, and work from that to work out what an equitable London treaty would look like. Thank you very much. Take care and hope you have a nice day.